All right, before we start, we're going to start on, let's see, I think it is aphorism 32. No. No, it must be aphorism 33. That's right, we did 31 and 32 last time. You probably remember that. <laughs> Um, okay, so before we start, let's talk a little bit about what we've read here. Now, I would say one of the main things that I notice with Nietzsche is, you know, when you're talking about all the things he brings up, there's not a lot of conclusions. It's not like, think this, think that. What he's done has uh, really amounted to raising questions. All right, and, and, and insofar as he's given suggestions as to the kind of answers, it's like, Really, it's more hints as to what not to go for. So, for example, you know, we ask this question of what's the value of truth really? And he says, don't assume it's that great. Now, a lot of people take that to be, oh, well, he's, he's trashing the idea of truth. On the other hand, he says elsewhere in, in this book, um, you know, philosophers, including him, are addicted to this truth thing. We just don't know that it's necessarily better. Don't assume that. But he actually still does think, I believe, that it's better. It's just a more complicated uh, thing to justify than we assume. So, um, you know, he says that. He, he, he doesn't say, you know, he says, well, the way Plato thought was a more noble way to think. He doesn't actually say it's a good thing, and for someone like myself, I know well elsewhere, he's trash as Plato, and so he's saying nobility, not necessarily good. There's a lot of ways to analyze things where it breaks down and your assumptions aren't, you know, applicable anymore. Being noble isn't necessarily the best thing. But the biggest thing, and, you know, in the title, uh, beyond good and evil is probably his the fact that he's talking about that there's something beyond um, mere truth that it has something to do with what helps life grow that this is the criterion what helps life grow and we if we were to justify truth for example it would be because in some sense we could justify it's a part of that process helping life flourish and um, and that would that you know that's the part that becomes so controversial in Nietzsche, but um, I think it's a dangerous question, as he says. I don't think his answer is the answer. I don't even think that his answer is the answer that he is uh, suggesting. I think he's suggesting that there are answers in the future, which might be where we want to look um, and the future for him is any anything after the late 1800s so we're the future all right well let's let's get started shall we aphorism 33 my note from my 20s says the sign of a seduction hmm. don't know what I meant by that I have no idea. When I see my highlights, you know, my, my green highlights and stuff, it's like half the time I'm like, what the fuck? Why did I highlight that? <laughs> I love that. Okay. Aphorism 33, Beyond Good and Evil, Frederick Nutty, Walter Kaufman, so on and so forth. Okay. There is no other way. The feeling of devotion, self-sacrifice for one's neighbor... The whole morality of self-denial must be questioned mercilessly and taken to court, no less than the aesthetics of, quote-unquote, contemplation devoid of all interest, which is used today as a seductive guise for the emasculation of art to give it a good conscience. He uses the word conscience in an interesting way, like people want to have a good conscience, it's not it doesn't always lead them to the best behavior seems like the way he describes it um so self denial this is a big thing for me i mean i think that altruism it feels good it's not self denial it's a self actualization helping other people feels good 
And, but the idea that altruism is a self-denial and that that's a part of what makes it altruism, to me, that's a corruption. And this is one of my sympathies with Nietzsche because he talks a lot about that. It's like, no, it's not self-denial. It's fine to be good to someone else and you feel empowered. You are expressing your feelings of it, you know, what, what, how you want things to be. And it feels good. But when you're doing good things for other people and like, because I'm just giving, you know, it can, it doesn't work out. It's a self-defeating kind of charity. It, you know what I mean? There has to be a self-interest to charity where you feel like if you succeed, you've succeeded, right? If you go into something going, well, it's built to be failure, but at least I'm a good person because I'm giving. That's a problem. There's too much charm and sugar in these feelings of for others and not for myself. For us not to need to become doubly suspicious at this point and to ask, are these not perhaps seductions? That they please those who have them and those who enjoy their fruits and also the mere spectator, this does not yet constitute an argument in their favor, but rather invites caution. So let us be cautious. All right, so my angle on this is that if, you're, if you do nice things for other people, it feels good. Okay, his angle that he's pointing out is it feels good, so don't pretend you're doing it selflessly. The societal interpretation has been that, oh, well, he, you know, he's saying, you know, it feels good you're doing it for a selfish reason, really. You might not have figured out yet. My take is, yeah, there's a selfish reason that it feels good. Do it and realize you're actualizing yourself and helping others. And I think that's where Nietzsche is going. But it doesn't matter if he knew that. It's called the future. Right? If Nietzsche figured it out, it doesn't matter. He could still be telling us things that set us up for the future. You know, that's his justification. Not that he had the philosophy. He would he he would argue against that. It's like it's a philosophy of the future. I don't have it yet. I'm from an old age trying to say have a new age, okay? We didn't do it the final way paraphrasing Nietzsche. Okay, aphorism 34. All right, whatever philosophical standpoint one may adopt today, from every point of view, the erroneousness of the world in which we think we live is the surest and firmest fact that we can lay eyes on. We find reasons upon reasons for it which would like to lure us to hypotheses concerning a deceptive principle in, quote, the essence of things, end quote. But whoever holds our thinking itself, the spirit, in other words, responsible for the falseness of the wor world, an honorable way out which is chosen by every conscious or unconscious, Advocatus Dei, which means advocate of God, obviously. Whoever takes this world along with space, time, form, movement, to be falsely inferred, anyone like that would at least have ample reason to learn to be suspicious at long last of all thinking. Wouldn't thinking have put over on us the biggest hoax yet? And what warrant would there be that it would not continue to do what it has always done? In all seriousness, the innocence of our thinkers is somehow touching and evokes reverence, when today they still step before consciousness with the request that it should please give them honest answers. For example, whether it is soul, quote-unquote, and why it is so uh, why it so resolutely keeps the external world at a distance 
and other questions of that kind. The faith in quote-unquote immediate certainties is a moral naivete that reflects honor on us philosophers, but after all, we should not be quote-unquote merely moral men, right? That we keep the external world at the distance. Well, because we have no choice. Other questions of that kind. He argues a lot in the end of the second book against immediate certainties, right? There is no certainties that are immediate. He's not saying there's not a kind of certainty or something he would call certainty. He's saying immediate certainties. And yet, the way he likes to talk, he says, you know, to think of these things as immediate certainties, um, you know, like the law of cause and effect, or non-contradiction, better example, uh, even better example. He says it's a moral naivete that reflects honor on philosophers. It, you know, it's sort of endearing that we think that stuff is so true. Because then we act on it, and we act better on a faith in the truth than people that just like to make up their own truth and lie. But it's still a naivete. Okay, and that's what we all really should face. Instead of thinking we're just pure wisdom. There is a naivete in wisdom. There is irony and and things come from their opposite. So you know, it behooves us to to admit that to ourselves. But it doesn't mean you stop having those feelings and thoughts, right? Perhaps you can have them with less naivete, right? Or perhaps you can just overcome your naivete and have the real thought that it's more, that's more realistic or whatever. Now, people, when they're saying Nietzsche is some sort of a nihilist and emphasizing that, I think they're emphasizing that he's saying, yeah, you know what, just overcome it. Get a new idea. But that's not the way I take it. Now, that, that might be what Nietzsche thought, but I don't feel I, had to, I have to agree with him. And I think there's another option. Instead of overcoming it, just realize it's a naivete and try to find the real reason you're believing in, in that feeling, that your naivete enables you to have a feeling about that experience go ahead and have that feeling about the experience and explain it in a less naive way that that's what i take from it it's not what i think nietzsche was saying i'm saying it's what i think from the questions nietzsche is raising i th i think he raises a lot of questions that you're supposed to answer um, with your own version all right. Apart from morality, this faith, and, and when he's talking about morality, right, he's talking about what people think of as morality. At the same time, he's talking about what he thinks of morality. Those are two different things. I think when he's talking about overcoming morality, he's talking the morality of Christianity and the society that he was in. I think when he's talking about morality himself, he's talking about what he said earlier in this book which is that a man's morality or a person's morality is can be defined in terms of how they how they rank what they value what's their highest value their least value if take everything they care about what do they really care about what will they act on you know if it's threatened or whatever the other test might be Apart from morality, this faith is a stupidity that reflects little labor on us, uh, uh, that reflects little honor on us. That, uh, that was Freudian labor. In bourgeois life, ever-present suspicion may be considered a sign of bad character, and hence belong among things imprudent. He's going to say, we should be suspicious. We, free thinkers, right? And it's a we. He's talking about we, but I'm not one of his we free thinkers. I, I, I would rather consider myself one of his, you know, philosophers of the future. Because I am in the future. And, and actually, most of us, I would consider philosophers of the future. 
willing to engage in difficult facts, but in a somewhat quixotic way. Here among us, beyond the bourgeois world and its yes and no, what should prevent us from being imprudent and saying, a philosopher has nothing less than a right to bad character? I highlighted that in my past. A philosopher has nothing less than a right to bad character. Not really sure why I highlighted that. But I do understand, you know, quote unquote, he, it, bad character is in quotes, right? In other words, someone that's suspicious all the time. Oh, bad character. Not necessarily the worst thing in terms of understanding the world or being a philosopher. As the being who has so far always been fooled best on earth, meaning the philosopher. Yeah, I stopped at a comma, so, yeah, whatever. Deal with it. Semicolon. Dude has a lot of phrases in his sentences. He has a duty to s suspicion today, to squint maliciously out of every abyss of suspicion. Forgive me the joke of this gloomy grimace and trope, for I myself have learned long ago to think differently, to estimate differently with regard to deceiving and being deceived, and I keep in reserve at least a couple of jostles for the blind rage with which the philosophers resist being deceived. Why not? It is no more than a moral prejudice that truth is worth more than mere appearance. It is even the worst proved assumption there is in the world. See, Nietzsche is a, a, a philosopher of art, and I, I think, and therefore values appearance. It's not that it's more fundamentally true. He knows it's a big deceiver. But as a lover of art, well, what is an artist? What is a great artist or a professional artist? A, 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 an acceptable artist? Except for somebody that can um, uh, create an appearance that isn't mere, but that has a huge impact on you, can change your attitudes in life. For the better or for the worse perhaps but regardless of that a presenter of appearances that are not mere but that are some of the most moving things things that help you want to live or manage to live or you know help you commit suicide or not, right? I mean, because it doesn't have to be a pro-life art. At the point of philosophy of art, Nietzsche's philosophy of help promote life isn't a given, because there's plenty of art artists that are going the other way. No, it doesn't work out. It's absurd. And I think that's sort of the, the fulcrum of Nietzsche's philosophy in, in my estimation is a philosophy of art and that's why he feels so strong stating these things that a religious person might take as shocking and then we take as well what what do you really mean there when he's talking about truth not necessarily for sure worth more than appearance right from someone that says over and over including in this work and other works that you know he's a philosopher He's into truth. He just doesn't necessarily feel he can say that's an automatically obvious thing to believe in. Because if you have some other criteria by which you judge truth, it starts to get tricky. But he still likes truth. But he also likes appearance and art. And I agree with that. I like truth a lot, and I like it better than quote-unquote mere appearance, but I'm not ready to say that anything that merely appears like a movie that has a message, it's not real, it merely appears this way or that, that that's worth less than a quote-unquote truth based on our difficulties defining truth. Right. I think a good movie, a good thought-provoking movie on a subject can possibly be better than 
for example, a video I might make on the same subject that happened to contain the truth or that somebody that disagrees with me maybe has the truth and they make that video. I think a movie, a mere appearance that's thought-provoking, might actually be more productive and in a lot of ways better and worth more than that truth. What makes the truth of value to me is its persistability and it's sort of like you can deny the truth but it'll keep knocking again and go hey but wait hey that's sort of the a value of the truth it's like a weak force like gravity where over the long run it's the strongest force because it just doesn't relent but in in the short term it might not be the strongest force and it might not be worth more than a mere appearance if that mere appearance somehow helps you on your path to enlightenment opens your mind in a way it perhaps prepares you for the truth that ideally you would have already accepted because in the long run yeah it's all about the truth it's about the truth I'm in that same group we all are in this discussion we're all trying to grab the truth we just think it's a different but we don't disagree on this attempt to get the truth and Nietzsche is sort of saying look we're a great club we truth lovers but let's ask ourselves if we can justify it we might learn something in the process the fear that you might learn that you prefer error and lies it's not a fear you should entertain or worry about if, if that's the case then that's who you really are believe me many people and most of us will end up answering that question with new answers that say why we prefer the truth and why we'll continue to do it and those of us that discover no I'd rather lie I'd rather you know manipulate the world we probably were already that way better that we should figure it out and stop cluttering up the, the, the you know the space in which people want to learn the truth let at least this much be admitted there would be no life at all if not on the basis of a perspective of perspective estimates and appearance and if with the virtuous enthusiasm and clumsiness of some philosophers one wanted to abolish the apparent world altogether well supposing you could do that at least nothing would be left of your truth either indeed what forces us at all to suppose that there is an essential opposition of true and false right the answer to this is that we have appearances he's saying if you were to go the merely appearing and you were to be a fanatic about that and get rid of all the mere merely apparent you would get rid of the truth as well and the falsity you would get rid of all appearance you would get rid of anything that wasn't mere appearance is it not sufficient to assume degrees of apparentness and as it were lighter and darker shadows and shades of appearance different values to use the language of painters why couldn't the world that concerns us be a fiction and if somebody asked but to a fiction there surely belongs an author couldn't one answer simply why doesn't this quote unquote belongs perhaps belong to the fiction too is it not permitted to be a bit ironical about the subject no less than the predicate and the object shouldn't philosophers be permitted to rise above faith in grammar all due respect for governesses but hasn't the time come for philosophy to renounce the faith in governesses <laughs> So he talks about a fundamental opposition between truth and falsity. It's not saying there's none, that you can't make one. But he's trying to break up our reliance. We're trying to, 
in genealogy and morals and so on, we're asking, what is this faith in truth? Why do we love truth? Why do we want to find it? What good is it for us, really? We're dealing with a populace that thinks the white lie and the big lie is the most expedient and will be the best for you in your mortal life. That's what people fucking think. Face reality. That's what they think. We're philosophers. We're like, no, truth is much better. Well, prove it. Or don't prove it and figure out what's really going on, right? And it doesn't mean you have to give up your your desire to forward the truth. It, it's supposed it will aid that. And again, that's my take. People, some people interpret them. No, we're beyond truth. It's a postmodern thing where it's just all bullshit. If you read all Nietzsche, I think it's pretty clear he's into his idea of the truth. He says he is. He says. And he's just like, that doesn't mean that I automatically am. Just because I believe in something, just because I'm part of this hobby, just because I think flying remote control planes is the best thing in the world, doesn't mean it fundamentally is. Just because I'm talking with a bunch of people that are in the same hobby and they all agree that, doesn't mean it fundamentally is. And I'll be the guy that says, you know, wait a second. Maybe we need to think about why we're doing this. Not to stop doing it, but to do it better.